take your Bible and turn to the book of Acts, chapter number 26. Now, I'm going to back up uh, to the 25th chapter of the book of Acts. Now, when you look at the 25th chapter of Acts, there is a, a fellow there by the name of Festus. He is a ruler. Paul is in prison. He is in Caesarea Philippi. He is in prison there. Now, King Agrippa, well, Festus, he, he goes to Jerusalem, but he comes back. He comes back to Caesarea because they wanted to send Paul to Jerusalem uh, in order that they might try him there. However, Festus and Paul said, no, uh, you know, I'm a Roman. I can do, uh, I have certain rights and regulations that you must abide by. In any rate, Festus comes back to Caesarea because he had heard that they were going to try to kill Paul if they brought him to Jerusalem, and he did not want that to take place. So when he comes back to Caesarea, King Agrippa and his wife Bernice, now, uh, I, you, you just got to look at this, read it, and it's kind of an exciting thing because uh, here is King Agrippa, and he comes to Caesarea, and Festus tells him, say, look, we've got this fellow by the name of Paul. We we have him in prison. Uh, I mean, the Jews are wanting to kill him. And, uh, you know, I thought maybe you would like to hear what he has to say. King Agrippa said, I'd like to do that. So he and Bernice, and you know what the Bible says? It's kind of interesting because the Bible says with much pomp. Now you can imagine what it would be like. Here is King Agrippa, and he comes with his wife Bernice, uh, a lot of ceremony going on, and they call Paul in. And he said, I'm going to give you an opportunity to speak. Paul expressed his thanks for that opportunity. And basically what he does, he begins to tell King Agrippa, uh, as well as Festus, <coughs> in one section, it's kind of interesting, because Festus, he speaks up, he said, man, you're a madman. Well, Paul said, no, I'm not mad. Uh, I'm not a mad man. In other words, I'm not crazy. I want you to listen to what I have to say. Now he speaks, and here's what he says. He tells King Agrippa about his conversion, how that he was on the road to Damascus, how that he had persecuted Christians, how that he was going there to do so, and how that he met the Lord on the way. And he talks about again, and, and he tells about how that he was converted and how Christ had been resurrected from the dead. Now in the course of this, King Agrippa makes a statement to Paul and he says to him in Acts chapter 26 and verse number 28, Then the Bible says, Then Agrippa said unto Paul, Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. Now when you look at that passage of Scripture, here is this king and he has intently listened to the message of the Apostle Paul. This man who had persecuted Christians. This man who had taken now, after obeying the gospel of Christ, and had taken these missionary journeys, had converted hundreds as a result of preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now he had also, before Festus, had appealed to Caesar. Now, later on, they said, look, if you had not appealed to Caesar, we don't see anything, any reason we could keep you. Uh, we would have let you go. But since you have appealed to Augustus Caesar, then that's where you shall go. Now then, Agrippa made a statement. He said, almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. Now, my friend, I want you and I to look at that statement today as we study this particular topic. Because as you do, there are five things in that one verse that will defeat much error that we see in our world today. There's a lot of false teaching. Jesus said in Matthew 7, verse number 15, you remember that he said, Beware of false prophets, for they have come to you in sheep's clothing. Beware of false prophets, which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. You shall know them by their fruits. In the book of 2 Peter, chapter number 2, and verse number 1, the Bible says there were false prophets among the people, even as there shall also be false teachers among you, who privately shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord which bought them, and shall bring upon themselves swift destruction, and many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. 1 John 4 verse 1, John said, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits where they are of God, for many false prophets have gone out into the world. See, folks have this idea that if, if you just attach the word religion to 
something, that automatically makes it good. No, 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 no. Jesus said in Matthew 7, Not every man that saith to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he which doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will come to me in that day, and they'll say, Lord, did we not prophesy in thy name, and in thy name cast out devils, do many great works? Now they were religious. But they were wrong. And he said, depart from me. I did not recognize your works. Now, here's what I want you to look at with me today. Acts 26 and verse number 28. The Bible said, almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. Now, I want to take and break that verse down. Number one, here are the false doctrines that are defeated in this verse. Number one, almost defeats faith only. Now notice what is taking on. What is faith only? Well, faith only is simply the doctrine that says all you have to do is believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. Now, folks will go to the book of Acts chapter number 16 and they will see, remember, Paul and Silas were in prison praying and singing praises unto God. Uh, there was an earthquake. They were loosed. The jailer thought uh, that they had escaped. He was about to kill himself. Uh, Paul said, do thyself no harm we're all here. He called for a light. He came in, fell down at the feet of Paul and Silas, and he asked this question, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And then Paul said to him, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Folks say, Oh, wow. Man, that's all you have to do. That's it. And so there's nothing else for an individual to do. But now I want you to look at something here. Notice that if faith only simply believing in the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember what James chapter number 2 says? You show me your faith without your works, and I by my works will show you my faith. Do you know that the only time the words faith only are used in Scripture is to defeat that very doctrine? Not by faith only, that men are not saved by faith alone. And so when you look at this in Acts chapter 26 and verse number 28, and he uses that word almost, it defeats faith only. Somebody said, well, what do you mean? Well, because of this. If you back up a verse in Acts 26 and verse number 27, listen to what Paul said to King Agrippa. He said, King Agrippa, believest thou the prophets? And then he said this, I know that thou believest. Well, I want to ask you a question. If faith only is simply believing in Jesus Christ, or simply believing in the prophets, or simply believing in God, if that was all that an individual needed to do to be saved, then my question is this, why would it be necessary for Agrippa to say, almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian? He, he could have said and should have said, oh, I am, uh, Paul, Paul, now listen here, Paul, you've been preaching, but I'm going to tell you, I'm already a Christian. I believe in God. No, 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 no. He said, almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. In John chapter number 12, verses 42 and verse number 43, the Bible says, Nevertheless, among the chief rulers also many believed on him. Well, now, my friend, if we stopped at that particular phrase in the New Testament, then well, they believed on him. But now, watch this. The Bible says, But because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue. For they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. Now, my friend, that ought to tell us something. Also in James 2 and verse 19, what do we find? We find that the demons believed and trembled. And so in Acts 26 and verse number 28, when the Scripture says, Almost thou persuades me to be a Christian, that defeats this concept of faith only salvation simply because, I mean, he believed. We find in John 12, 42 and 43 uh, that among the chief rulers they believed. We find that the demons believed. And yet, my friend, you and I know and we understand that not a single one of them were Christians. Not any of them were saved simply because they believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. So when you and I look at this verse of Scripture, and we look at this doctrine of faith only, the New Testament does not teach it. And though, my friend, listen, you examine those individuals. When some preacher tells you that all you have to do is accept the Lord Jesus Christ in your heart, just believe on Him and that's all you have to do, my friend, you need to examine the Scripture to see what the Bible teaches. Because that is defeated in Acts chapter number 26 and verse number 28. Now, number two, the word thou. 
Somebody said, well, I don't understand this. <laughs> how, does that, how does that defeat something? Well, now watch this. Notice what he said again. Now, by the end of this program, my friend, I hope you know this verse by memory. Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. Now, that little word thou, you know what, you know what, who, what do you mean by the word thou, Agrippa? He's referring to Paul. He said, in other words, let's, let's back it up a little. Almost, Paul, you are persuading me to be a Christian. See, now that, defa that defeats the direct operation of the Holy Spirit. Now the direct of the operation of the Holy Spirit simply says that the Holy Spirit is going to work on you. And as a result of the Holy Spirit working on you, then you're going to come to a knowledge of truth and you're going to be saved. No. The Holy Spirit has given us the Word of God. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, the Bible says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, and righteousness, that the man of God might be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto every good work. Now, in Acts 2 and verse numbers 37 and 38, the Bible says, Now, when they heard this, remember this, the word thou, defeats the direct operation of the Holy Spirit because Acts 2, 37 and 38, the Bible says, now when they heard this, what did they hear? They heard that they had been guilty of crucifying the Son of God. Peter had told them, Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs which God did by him in the midst of you as you yourselves also know him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God you have with wicked hands slain the Son of God. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their hearts. They cried out to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? What pricked their heart, my friend? It was the word that Peter had preached to them on the day of Pentecost. Now you go back to Acts chapter number 2. The Holy Spirit came upon the apostles. The Holy Spirit came upon the apostles and not on the people on the day of Pentecost. They were convicted of their sin as a result of the preaching of the gospel. Now when they heard this, they cried out to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said to them, Repent and to be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, or the Holy Ghost King James Version. Now notice this again. In Acts 22 and verse number 16, when you study the Bible, my friend, and you look, I mean, read through the entire book of Acts. When you and I study the Bible, there's one thing that is evident. And that is that the Holy Spirit did not operate directly on any individual and motivate him to obey the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Every one of them. Every one of them. Acts chapter number 2. Acts chapter number 8, when we uh, read about the uh, Ethiopian eunuch. Acts chapter number 9, the Apostle Paul. Acts chapter number 10, Cornelius. Acts chapter number 16, the Philippian jailer. Now in Acts chapter number 22, in verse 16, Paul, in relating his conversion, said this. Ananias came to him and he said, Saul, why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sin, calling on the name of the Lord. Thou defeats the doctrine of the salvation or the operation of the Holy Spirit operating directly upon someone and motivating them to obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. Man hears the word of God. Romans 10 and verse 17, the Bible said, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Now then, let's look at number three. Notice this. He says, Almost thou... Look at the next words, two of them. Persuadeth me. Now what does that do? That defeats the mourner's bitch. Somebody said, huh? <laughs> now you may not be familiar with that. It is not the same as it was maybe 50 or 60 years ago. There were some religions, some religious groups. And in order for you to be saved, you would have to come down to what they call the mourner's bench and beg God to save you. Oh, I mean, I've heard, of, I've heard of people praying all night long. And they're asking God. They're asking God to save them. And, 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 and uh, I mean, there are folks who have sat up all night long. They have gone to the mourner's bench. Now, in the book of 2 Corinthians 5, verse number 11, the Bible says, Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, listen to this, we persuade men. My friend, listen to this. 
You and I do not have to beg God to save us. In Luke 19, verse number 10, Jesus said, I am come to seek and to save those which are lost. I do not have to beg God to say. As a matter of fact, John 3, 16, the Bible says God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth on Him should not perish but have everlasting life. My friend, you and I recognize that our Lord Jesus Christ suffered the pain of death on the cross in order that you and I can be saved. He shed His blood. The Bible says without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. And the Bible says that it's not possible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. And so we, He said, Thou persuadest me to be a Christian. And that, that defeats this idea of me trying to beg, uh, see what I need to do is submit myself. We do not have to beg God to save us. He sent His Son to die in order that you and I can be saved. See, it is a matter of my submitting my will to the will of God. That's what Jesus said, John 12, 48. He said, He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my word hath one that judgeth him. The words that I speak unto you, they shall judge you in the last day. My friend, in the book of Luke, chapter number 15, the Bible tells us about the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost boy. And you remember how that the coin was, uh, the, the sheep that was lost, uh, and the shepherd left the ninety and nine, and what did he do? Go in search of that one sheep that was lost and bring it back. And what the Bible says? The Bible says the angels in heaven rejoice over one sinner that repenteth more than over ninety nine just that need no repentance. What do we find? The coin that was lost. Oh, the lady, she, she sweeps, she cleans, finding that coin. And the Bible says the angels in heaven rejoice. When you and I see that prodigal son and he comes home, what does the Bible tell us? That he rejoices. See, it's not, oh God, please save me. No, 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 no. Now, you, you know how folks are asking God, God wants you and he wants me and he wants us on his terms, not on ours. See, the problem is, I want to serve God on my own terms. And so in Acts 26 and verse number 28, when the Bible says, almost thou persuadest me, then you and I can see that that defeats this idea because man is persuaded. Man is, has to be persuaded to do the will of God. We don't have to beg God. We have to be persuaded. And that's why he said, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Number four, to become. Now what that does, that terminology, he said, almost thou persuadest me to become defeats this concept of deading religion. Oh, you remember what Jesus said in John, or excuse me, Luke chapter number six and verse number 46? Why call you me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? See, Obedience and salvation, or salvation is prefaced as a result of obedience. In Matthew chapter 7, we quoted this a little bit earlier in our program. Not every man that saith to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, he which doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. You see, religion is not something you get. Some folks have the idea, well, boy, you know, I'm sitting in a church building somewhere. And it, you've heard this. I mean, you've heard this. Sitting in a church building doesn't make you a Christian any more than going into McDonald's makes you a hamburger. I mean, you, you've heard that before. But see, people have this idea that, well, uh, you know, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get religion. No, my friend, you know what you're going to do? You're going to be obedient to the will of God. In the book of James, chapter number 1, verses 26 and 27, the Bible says, if any among you seem to be religious, <laughs> seem to be religious, See this idea again of getting religion? And he said, If any among you seem to be religious and bridleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is vain. Pure religion. And undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. See, there is a pure religion. Pure religion, undefiled before God the Father is this. And so this idea that I'm going to get religion, see, in Acts 26 and verse number 28, Agrippa said, Almost thou persuadest me to do what? To become a Christian. And so that's what we would encourage you as well to do. Now, let's look at the last one that we're thinking about today, and that is this. That is the word a Christian. 
Acts 26, 28, Almost thou persuadest me, almost, Paul, you know, Agrippa, you know, Felix later on, you remember what the Bible tells us about Felix? The Bible said when he reasoned of righteousness, temperance, and the judgment to come, he said, Paul, you go your way. When I have a convenient season, I'll call for you. Never have any record of him calling for him. And so here in Acts chapter number 26, we see Agrippa and he says, Well, almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. Defeats the concept of denominationalism. Now notice this. He didn't say to Paul on that occasion, Almost you persuaded me to be a member of the blank, 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 blank. Put whatever title you want to church in there. No. He didn't do that. You know why? Because there's only one body. You can only be a Christian in the one body. In Acts 4 and verse number 12, the Bible says, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there's none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. My question to all of us today is simply this. Am I a Christian? Am I a follower of Christ according to His will? In Ephesians chapter 4, the Bible says there is one body and one spirit, even as you're called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father who is above all, through all, and in you all. Now I want to underline this. Notice what the Bible says. See, denominationalism, my friend, is a man-made concept. The word denominationalism or denomination uh, means division. Now, we know 1 Corinthians chapter number 1, 10 through 13, Paul said, I beseech you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ that you all speak the same thing. There be no division among you, but that you be perfectly joined together on the same mind, the same judgment. You know, here's a, a man and, and his wife, husband and wife, and, and one has, quotation marks, one religion, and one is another religion, and they get into this argument about, well, uh, which one of these religions is right? My friend, there's only one right religion, and that is the church of the New Testament that we read about in the Bible. There is one body, not 250, not 3,000, not 5,000, one body, and that is the church that belonged to Jesus Christ. In the book of Ephesians chapter number 1, the Bible said, "...that put all things under His feet, and given to be head over all things to the church, which is His body, the fullness of Him that filleth all in all." Christ is head of the body of the church. So when Agrippa said in Acts chapter 26, verse 28, Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian, had he obeyed the gospel and been baptized for the remission of his sins, he would have been added to the Lord's kingdom. In Acts 2 and verse number 47, the Bible says, And the Lord added to the church daily, such as should be saved, or those that were being saved. So when you and I look at this passage of Scripture, there are five false doctrines that are condemned in this where or answered, what are defeated, uh, in this one passage of Scripture. We thank you very much for watching the Fountain of Life television program today. We encourage you to watch it the next time it is on. May God bless you. William Dixon lived in England. He was a widower who had lost his only son. One day he saw that the house of his neighbor was on fire. Although the aged owner was rescued, the orphaned grandson was trapped in the blaze. Dixon climbed an iron pipe on the side of the house and lowered the boy to safety, although his hand that had held the pipe was badly burned. Shortly after the fire, the grandmother died and the townspeople wondered who would care for the boy. Two volunteers appeared before the town council. One was a father who had lost his son and wanted to adopt the boy as his own. Dixon was the other, and when it was his turn to speak his reasons, he merely held up his scarred hand, the one burned saving the boy from the fire. When the vote was taken, the boy was given to William Dixon. I'm Jim Dearman with a brief message of truth for the world. Now it's time for a GBN Daily Lift. Ye shall not add unto the word which I command you, neither shall ye diminish aught from it, that ye may keep the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you. Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 2. The practice of man since the beginning is the changing of God's word. Think about it. It's 11 o'clock. This is WJHF. Selected. Selected.